Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on alternative investments and the learning module on hedge funds. I want you to think back a century ago, back into the 1920s, with the origin of mutual funds. And I want you to think about the strategy employed by all of those investors and fund managers. <clears throat> it was super simple. What did investors do? They wanted to find a company and buy it at a low price and then sell it at a high price. Everybody was taking the long position. And this was pretty much the standard strategy in the 20s and 30s and 40s, but somewhere around 1950, this dude came along, A.W. Jones, uh, and said, you know what? I'm tired of taking the long position. What about all those companies who stink? And I know that their stock price is going to fall. So A.W. Jones decided to start shorting as part of a fund strategy. In fact, he was kind of like the George Costanza of 1950 in the investing world. Those of you who are Seinfeld fans know that in one episode, George did the opposite of everything that he had ever done in his life. He ended up getting a date with a beautiful girl. He ended up getting a job with the New York Yankees. He ended up getting a super nice apartment just because he did the opposite. So I want you to think of hedge funds are kind of the opposite of mutual funds. And so this dude back in 1950, he introduced this concept of a hedge fund and it was coined hedge fund, not because it reduced risk, but because the natural long short positions were opposite of each other. And so there was some kind of a hedge in there. And you'll see this opposite kind of a strategy as we go through this entire slide deck. So we'll talk about features forms and vehicles. And then in the end, we'll go ahead and have a conversation just like we did with every other alternative investment. How does this fit into portfolio risk, portfolio return, and then diversification? You've heard me use that word correlation and diversification. Those are two words. Those two words uh, in all of the alternative investment learning modules. So this will be no exception. All right, so understanding hedge fund, hedge fund. So uh, one of the really good uh, potential exam questions is for the institute to say, here's a mutual fund, here's a hedge fund. What's the difference between those two? But before we need to look at the differences, we need to look at those similarities. You know, So these are just private investment vehicles. And instead of the hedge fund manager saying something like, hey, send me your money, I'm going to invest in these stocks and bonds, implying that we're going to take long positions in those financial securities, the hedge fund manager says, hey, send me your money, I'm going to do whatever I want with it. And the whatever I want with it doesn't include going to Las Vegas and, uh, you know, playing poker, but it includes almost anything that's out there in the financial trading universe. So notice that second teardrop point, mix of debt, equity, leverage. This is super important. One of the things that, uh, uh, the extra things that uh, this dude Jones did in 1949 or 1951, whatever, whatever that was, is that not only did he take long and short positions, but he also used margins and leverage as much as he could to magnify his return. So leverage is a super important concept in hedge funds. Uh, we'll have short conversations in this slide deck about derivatives, but we've had really good conversations about options and futures contracts and, uh, and swap contracts. So what's the goal here? The goal here is exactly what the goal is every time we uh, try to find a financial security. Go back to the Harry Markowitz efficient frontier. What we're trying to do is push upward and to the left, right? We're trying to get some extra return and we're trying to lower risk. Now, one of the interesting things about hedge funds, because the hedge fund manager says something like, send me your money, I can do anything I want with it. There are very few uh, acceptable benchmarks out there. So it's not like you can go out and say, all right, I have a well-diversified portfolio of 427 stocks. I'm going to compare that to the S&P 500 index. There's no such thing out there as like the super hedge fund index. I mean, there are indexes out there, but a lot of times they don't work and they're not really relevant for each unique hedge fund manager. And so that's why we have bolded down there on the bottom right, absolute return standard rather than tracking a benchmark. So that's probably another good difference between uh, a mutual fund and a hedge fund. <clears throat> All right, a couple of other things here that are good potential exam questions. Um, look at that second block point, the red one there, contrary to hedging against market movements. This is what I was saying about the 
the origin of the term hedge fund. It's not really a hedge. Actually, you could call it a speculative fund strategy. That would be more in line with the actual investment policies uh, pursued by these hedge fund managers. Notice what we have in bold, intensify overall risk exposure. But the cool thing about hedge funds as part of this larger alternative investment universe is that we're trying to intensify overall risk exposure to magnify returns with the idea that over the super long term, that that low correlation coefficient is going to lessen risk. We're gonna move over to the, uh, to the vertical axis in that Harry Markowitz efficient frontier efficient frontier. Now, because hedge funds have some unique characteristics that we'll talk about as we go through this slide deck, you can't really come up with a, a, a sentence that says, oh, if I invest in this hedge fund, I'm going to have a correlation coefficient of 0.01 with my equity portfolio. Therefore, I'm going to get immediate diversification benefits. No, those, those diversification benefits in hedge funds, they occur over the long term. How about super long term? <clears throat> now, the idea, look at the purple block box in there. This is what I was saying about this, uh, this Jones dude a long, long time ago. You know, you, if you have a short position and you have a long position, then those two naturally kind of offset each other. So that's this, uh, that's this idea of, of hedging. There we go. Look at the blue one down there, the dark blue. Amplify potential returns. This is what I, you've heard me say this before, that uh, when you use leverage, there are benefits of leverage. I call it the beauty of leverage. This is taking an asset that returns 10% to the cash investor, but maybe returns 30% to the hedge fund investor because of that leverage. That's the beauty of leverage. Now, of course, there's the ugliness of leverage. If, uh, if you have an asset that falls by 10%, you can use leverage and turn it into a minus 30%. Uh, holding period return. So make certain that you're aware that leverage magnifies returns, both positive and negative. Here's a good slide illustrating the differences between uh, mutual funds and hedge funds. You know, typically mutual fund managers, they get their fixed compensation. It might come out of some other fee. It might come out of the expense ratio, but whatever it is, you know, it's probably a percentage of of the assets and the performance really doesn't uh, have anything to do with how much money a mutual fund manager makes. I tell my students this all the time. I said, look, you guys need to grow up and become mutual fund managers. And then nobody really cares what you're going to perform, what your performance might be. Now, of course, I exaggerate and they laugh and they say, oh, Jim, I don't think you're right about that. And of course, I'm, I'm not, but I'm emphasizing the point that uh, mutual fund managers, you know, they have the potential uh, to make uh, ton, tons of money. In fact, I have <clears throat> I just got an email from one of my former students who said, hey, I have left this giant firm and I've started my own fund. And I was like, hey, this is really cool stuff. Hedge fund managers, <clears throat> they receive, you know, pretty much a, a standard kind of a fee like the mutual fund managers. Maybe it's one or two percent of the assets under management, but then they'll get a performance-based fee. Maybe that performance-based fee is as much as 20 percent, 30 percent, 100 percent, probably not 100 percent. Remember what I said earlier that the hedge fund manager says, send me your money, I'm going to do anything I want with it. You know, within the context of regular old uh, financial investing, that means they have greater financial flexibility, super, super flexible. Mutual funds, you know, tons and tons of regulation out there. Hedge fund managers, um, the Institute uses that terminology there, minimal regulation and uh, Typically, typically what happens, you know, as we're evolving over time, there's a push from politicians to have greater regulation and greater oversight um, in the hedge fund industry. Another good difference between the two is that, of course, you and I, we can own a mutual fund and we can send our money back and forth to the mutual fund manager whenever we want. Hedge funds have more restrictions. In fact, they, you know, they have a huge a huge uh, initial investment. You know, I think you can get into like the uh, the Vanguard 500 index fund for as little as two or three thousand dollars. But to get into, let's say, Jim's hedge fund, it might cost you twenty million dollars. You know, so those things then are privately owned. You know, they're not publicly traded. You can't get in and out whenever you want to. So that's probably another good exam question. 
Uh, hedge fund strategies. All right, so we're going to talk about here. Let me just flip ahead just so you kind of see what's going on here. So we'll have, what is that, eight or ten different kinds of uh, hedge funds. So let's go ahead and as we're going through these next handful of slides, be able to identify what kind of a strategy. And the questions at the end of this learning module, there's a handful of them that, that look just like this. They'll say something like, oh, you know, here's what the hedge fund manager is doing. Which strategy is the manager pursuing? And so it should be uh, an obvious kind of a notion. So equity hedge funds, um, this is what the Jones guy did back in 1950. And so what does this mean? Long and short positions. Uh, what does the hedge fund manager look to? Remember, I say this regularly. The Institute is very big on identifying the difference between the top down, <clears throat> excuse me, and the bottom up. So this hedge fund manager looks at the individual companies and says something like, hey, this is a good company. I'm going to go ahead and further investigate, see if I think that the, uh, the equity is undervalued. Maybe the debt is undervalued. Maybe some of the bonds have embedded options in there and I can kind of separate, uh, uh, separate those bonds into their straight bonds, into their, uh, in, into their option, their embedded option component. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, so make sure you understand when we're looking at this bottom up approach, we're looking at the company and we're looking at everything, the left hand side, the right hand and the bottom right hand side of the balance sheet, which includes an evaluation of the debt. So this equity hedge fund manager, we're not we're not investing in the debt, but we need to understand the debt and we'll get to we'll get to investing in fixed income uh, securities here in just a little bit. So what does this mean? Equity hedge funds. We're going to take the long and short position. Think of uh, A.W. Jones, 1950, and we're going to use uh, probably some leverage, but we're also going to buy calls and puts and maybe some other kind of an option strategy in there and uh, long and short positions in futures contracts. And we can uh, swap fixed for floating and all sorts of fun things in the swap market. So let's take a look at some of these unique equity hedge fund strategy. So this is probably the fundamental long short strategy employed by A.W. Jones long, long time ago. You know, think about all the research that the Institute has taught us to perform. You know, we go and look at a company, let's do bottom up or we could do top down and we find these handful of companies and let's suppose there, there are five of them that catch our attention and four of them we think are undervalued and one of them we think is overvalued. So back in the old days, well, we would just we would just take the long position in those four and ignore the fifth, or we would sell the fifth if, if it was a part of our portfolio. But now if we take the short position, we can benefit on both sides. So look at that first uh, bullet point there, aiming to capture alpha um, when you reverse those trades, when the long position appreciates and the short position depreciates. Now, the fundamental growth strategy, go back to our mutual fund conversation where you have a, a, gro a, a mutual fund that focuses on growth. So what does this mean? We want companies that generate lots and lots of cash flow. Typically, they don't pay any dividends. So what they do, they reinvest that cash flow back into improving the quality of the assets. And so we eliminate those dividends. So we eliminate all the tax consequences and we eliminate all that kind of stuff and all the extra things that the investors have to do when they receive that dividend payment. And we just plow those cash flows back into the company to improve the quality of the asset. Remember in our corporate finance conversations, we introduced this concept of a terminal value. So you invest in this asset today, positive net present value. You receive these cash flows over time and you reinvest the cash flows to improve the quality, the future value of that asset. So that's fundamental growth strategy. And then the flip side of that, of course, is a fundamental value strategy where we take a look at maybe firms, maybe firms that pay lots and lots of dividends. Maybe they ha are in a mature industry, they pay lots of dividends and they're kind of out of favor. And so they're undervalued because, you know, they're not sexy. They're not uh, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal every day. Uh, they don't show up on MTV or wherever those other places are that kids watch these days. You know, fundamental value. You know, these are strong companies, core businesses that have mature products that generate sustainable, the sustainable operating cash flows, but maybe have fallen out of favor. 
short buy strategy, that's exactly what you think it might mean. So maybe we have three long positions and we have 13 short positions so that we have a short biased strategy. So the short bias means that you're heavily weighted to shorting the stocks. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have uh, have some long positions in there as well. Market neutral strategy. I don't really like this term because it implies that you really don't care what happens to the market. But think about shorting uh, a stock that has a beta of one and investing in a stock that has a beta of one. All right. So what those you have a minus one beta and a plus one beta because you're shorting it, right? You got to put the minus sign in front of it. So your market beta then would be zero. So you could make the claim that this is a market neutral strategy, but it's probably not um, because those two things probably uh, are not correlated with each other the way you think it is. But nevertheless, you know, this is the way the terminology presents itself to us. So we need to remember this, uh, this market neutral position. And so the idea is that you have a long position in, let's say, 10 stocks that are valued at, let's say, $10 million. And then you have 10 stocks over here that market value is $10 million. So you long and short 10 million on either, either side, and that's market neutral. But of course, what you're trying to do is you, you took the long position because you think those stocks are going up. You took the short position because you think those stocks are going down. And so you can arrive at this market neutral position with some really good quantitative analysis. You know, we did, uh, uh, we've done some simple linear regression. We'll do much more of that in level two. We'll do time series. We'll do uh, some analysis of variance. We'll do all sorts of fun stuff. We'll also have a short uh, learning module on technical analysis using past prices and volumes and other kind of trends to predict the future. And then fundamental analysis is essentially what the Institute is trying to teach us throughout levels one through three fundamentals, looking at the core value, the intrinsic value of a company. So here, before I go on, be able to answer a, a question here. Now, look, there's one, two, three, four, five of these uh, equity hedge strategies. So these are five potential questions on the exam. Here's a hedge fund manager, and this manager is doing this and this and this. Which of these strategies is he or she pursuing? So that, that makes perfect sense, right? Whoops, I think I went one too many. All right, so how about event-driven hedge funds? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what? We don't want to invest in any company that is dull, right? What do dull companies do? You know, they generate earnings per share and cash flows. Maybe they pay a little bit of a dividend every uh, every three months. You know, they have a nice marketing strategy. Yeah, dull, dull, dull. What we want is we want excitement, right? We want, uh, we want a James Bond movie with bombs and jumping off of towers and all sorts of fun stuff. So what are those corporate events that could be related to a James Bond movie, like a merger, like an acquisition, a restructuring, um, changes in corporate structure, the firing of a chief executive officer, uh, any kind of an interesting scenario in which there is the potential for tremendous price movement. Now, we can do common and preferred stocks. We can do fixed income securities. We can do options. We can do futures contracts. We can do swap contracts. Remember in the swap market, the swap market is only really limited in what your imagination is. So you could, you could, as a hedge fund manager, you know, if you have, you know, billions of dollars, you could approach a financial institution and say, hey, I want to swap the, uh, the returns on the next James Bond movie for the returns on the next Star Wars movie. Are they making another Star Wars movie? You know, so what are you doing? You're just swapping, you're betting. Well, how did I say this? You're bet. Well, of course, I'm going to say this. You're betting that James Bond returns uh, are greater than the returns to Star Wars. I mean, that sounds like a perfectly legitimate swap contract to me based on, uh, based on some kind of a major event, like a major movie event. If the Institute asks you a James Bond swap question, you're probably not going to get it right anyway. So uh, pick B for Bond. All right, how about some other things here? Distress, uh, nearing bankruptcy or restructuring, special situations. This is where uh, reading the Wall Street Journal really pays off. These special situations where you have massive share repurchases, like a Dutch auction repurchase. We'll talk about that in level two. Uh, spin-offs, any kind of uh, any kind of special situations, and then activist strategies. This has become fairly important in the last couple of decades. I actually wrote part of my dissertation on 
um, uh, the adoption of poison pill securities. Some people like poison pill security, some people don't like it. And so nowadays there are lots of activist investors who say something like, look, this company has a poison pill. We really don't want that poison pill because it's gonna prevent a takeover. We're gonna to have to forfeit a 50% average takeover premium. And so these influential investors could get together and say, hey, let's call attention to this company. It has a poison pill or it has a stinky uh, CEO or it has no idea what it's doing in operations or, or, or. And we want to change this by uh, changing the construction, of the composition of the board of directors. All right, how about relative value hedge funds? This is what I was hinting at earlier. Look at that first one, uh, convertible bond arbitrage. So what did I say earlier? We're going to take a look at this company. We're going to look at the top right and then the middle and the bottom right of the balance sheet. And somewhere in there, we're going to kind of come across a company that has bonds with embedded options, whether it's a call option or a put option or a conversion option, which is what we're talking about here. So what we can do is we can buy that convertible bond, right? That convertible bond at some point is going to be converted into shares of stock. So we're long on the convertible bond, but we're short on the stock. So this is really a natural hedge. Um, but we're, what we're doing is we're hedging against uh, bankruptcy risk. And we can do this by actually going out and buying the bonds and shorting the stock, or we can do it in uh, the option market, or we can do it in the swap market. <clears throat> now, fixed income general down there at the bottom, this is kind of, uh, you know, just a, a you know a broad way of looking at all of the cool stuff that we see on the right hand side of a balance sheet. And so the Institute focuses here on taking a look at two companies. One has uh, high grade from uh, Moody's, other one has low grade from Moody's. And so you take a look at these two balance sheets, income statements and statement of changes in cash flow. And you might say something like, you know what, this investment grade bond, maybe it's double A. And then this one over here, maybe it's double B. Boy, I don't like those two grades. I think the investment grade bond is going to fall and the uh, speculative or uh, non-investment grade bond is going to rise. So you can take long and short positions in, uh, in those bonds. You can also do this in the asset backed market, in the mortgage backed market. I mean, you can do it in any kind of a, any kind of a fixed income market. And so then you have this multi strategy where you're going to do all the other stuff in there together. This is one of those things that I was saying earlier. The hedge fund manager says, hey, send me your money. I can do anything I want with it. It's legal, right? And not going to Las Vegas and not betting on uh, LeBron James to win another uh, NBA championship. So gambling, make sure you know that. When I say do whatever you want with it, gambling is right out. <laughs> uh, how about opportunistic hedge funds? So remember back in our conversations of economics, we had we had a microeconomics learning module. We had a macroeconomics learning module. We had an international uh, learning module. And so what did we learn in there? We learned the importance of things like GDP and employment and imports and exports and all that kind of fun stuff. So there are hedge funds out there under this term opportunistic hedge funds that go out and evaluate this on a macro level, right? So this is top down. Uh, so you evaluate the macro economy and say, okay, these here's the economy, here are the expected changes in the economy, and these firms down here will benefit from those changes, and these firms over here will not benefit from those changes, and therefore you can do, you know, you can take the long and short positions and all that. So there's the macro, there's the top down that I was talking about. So what do you need to know? You need to know about major economic trends. And then you can use leverage, you can use market margins, you can use any kind of a market out there. But comma, make sure you're aware of this. Uh, in order to do this top down approach, you need to make certain that you're aware of all of the central bank's activities and their influence on things like interest rates. Right. What does the central bank do? It controls the money supply of the economy. And so if it expands the money supply, probably the value of that currency is going to go down and vice versa. And so if you knew exactly what was going to happen in the future, you know, I tell my students, if you could ever drive 88 miles an hour in a time machine like Marty and Doc did in Back to the Future, all you really need to do is go 
one or two days ahead and find out what the central bank is going to announce and then just come back to the present and then you could be a multi-billionaire by the time the central bank makes that announcement whether it's an increase or a decrease in uh, in an interest rate now all of these things that we've been talking about they can be uh, they can largely be achieved through the derivatives market. So we have this managed futures fund description. So typically what happens is that the hedge fund manager will hire this advisor, some kind of a commodity trading specialist who knows everything about the, the markets that are out there. And so you achieve these positions, not directly by making these investments, but by going to the futures market and, and doing this. I have uh, I had a former uh, a former MBA student who moved out to the Midwest and um, uh, was in charge of this Midwest. He, he went to work for a big farm in charge of their hedging. And so he did lots and lots of hedging. But then after a while, he got into uh, as a commodity trading advisor. And it's all sorts of super fun stuff. The application of everything that we're uh, learning here in the CFA program really is super cool. And then what you can do is you can say something like, you know what, I don't really want to do any, well, I'm not going to go back to all those other four, whoops. Uh, you can say something like, you know what, I don't want to really spend all the time and effort trying to figure out which is my best hedge fund manager for my investment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide this multi-manager hedge funds. And there are lots and lots of ways that we can do this. Um, what are the distinguishing characteristics? Yeah, some flexibility, investment styles. You know, there's all sorts of extra things that you can do in there. Yeah, there are liquidity constraints. That's, that's an important part for all sorts of uh, hedge funds. You might have to pay more for it. Um, you might have to get permission to use derivatives. Yeah, there's lots and lots of good things there. All right, so this is the big challenge here, and this is what I hinted at at that previous slide. You know, let's suppose that we're a wealthy individual or we're a wealthy institutional investor, maybe a foundation, and we want to get exposure to hedge funds. So we're going to need $20 million. So we're not going to throw $20 million over to someone like me. You know, I'm just Jim's, uh, Jim's investment company. You know, what do I do? Well, I do whatever. So what you're going to do is you're going to go out and evaluate all of these hedge fund managers, and it's going to take a long time. You need to assess operational framework, risk management practice, portfolio performance. You need to do monitoring, reviewing, all that kind of stuff. So you're going to evaluate this, uh, this GP. And by the way, this is going to be a super point of emphasis in level two and, uh, and again in level three, this general partner, how this dude uh, takes all of this capital and responsibly invests it according to the guidelines. And so you have to have a sense of frameworks and management practices and all that. And so because of what I said earlier, that there is uh, this fewer regulations and oversight, there's this potential for fraud. You read the Wall Street Journal regularly, you'll read about a hedge fund manager who had, you know, $20 billion here, and all of a sudden, $3 billion of it is gone. Oh my gosh, we don't know where it went. And uh, you see this hedge fund manager, there's a picture with a zoom lens, you know, he, he's in somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, and he's got this giant uh, yacht out there. And so now you know where that money went. So evaluation of a hedge fund manager is way more complex than the evaluation of a mutual fund manager. All right, how about the risk? I, you know, I've pretty much uh, hinted and maybe even spoke directly about these so far in this learning module. So what do we need to worry about? We need to say something like, all right, over the long term, we're going to get higher returns, right? Hopefully, we're going to get less risk, but even if we have to take extra risk to get that higher return, we're going to be okay with it, right? So that's the first part there. But we want to worry about things about market turmoils. You know, so go back to the 2008 financial crisis. What did we learn? We learned that in times when people are just losing their brains over the economy and on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and in the options markets and the futures markets, we know that those very low correlations, they somehow become one. Now, I'm exaggerating there, but look, when you have bad news, then there's bad news everywhere. 
So those low correlation coefficients, which we were relying on, they really don't present themselves at the most time when we need it. And so this is really a, uh, um, a huge consideration in investing in the hedge fund market because what we want to do is uh, identify those hedge funds that have, here, let me go back here, that have all, all this good stuff, right? We've identified these hedge fund managers and we pick the hedge funds that we love based on these kinds of things, right? So what then happens is that we want to make certain that when we have a market turmoil, that that correlation coefficient doesn't turn into one or 0.9 or some or some high number, that we get those uh, we get those benefits. And what that means then is that, and I'm going to go back to what I didn't like in that market neutral strategy, that market neutral strategy doesn't imply neutrality. But what it implies, though, is that those correlation coefficients are going to stay low when we have market turmoil. So that's a big concern there. And then uh, because there's less regulation and uh, oversight, there's a possibility for an unethical fund manager. So you got to do this thorough due diligence. So can you or I do this? I mean, sure, we could. Do we have the capital? Do we have the time? Maybe not. So why don't we just hire someone else to do it? Yeah, it requires substantial initial investment. I said that earlier. And then, of course, the mutual fund manager says something like, hey, you know what? If you want your money tomorrow, just let me know and I'll send it to you tomorrow. But the hedge fund manager is going to say, boy, if you need your money tomorrow, you're in big trouble. I don't even come back next year or even in three years. Come back in five years, right? So there's these lockup periods where you don't have access to the capital. So, of course, not only is this for wealthier individual investors and then institutions that are interested in this, but hedge funds are only for those individuals and institutions who don't really need their money for five years, let's say. But, you know, everyone has their five year plan or their 10 year plan. But in seven years, you know, I'm going to do this big project. So I don't really care what happens during those first five years. But in year seven, boy, I want to get that 20 percent return. So think about that large and requirement for the initial investment as you know an opportunity cost. You got to evaluate: Are you going to be okay with missing out on all of those opportunities over the next handful of years? Uh, this slide here is a summary of boy just a couple of paragraphs. So I don't think this is a too big of a point of emphasis. So you have this feeder system. And so you think about this. So I could be Jim's hedge fund. And what I could do is I could say something like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open my hedge fund up to only people who live in Spain. All right. So I have all this. I have all of this capital from Spain. And what I'm going to do is that's going to feed into um, this larger, it's called a master structure, this master fund, and I'm going to put this master fund, how about if I just put it in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Maybe there's an island out there somewhere. So I put this in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and then what I can do is I can open it up to other countries. And so they kind of feed into the master fund. Um, and so this is typically what happens. Look down at the bottom there. There's the 2% management fee and the 20% uh, performance fee that I was talking about earlier. <clears throat> uh, look at the top bullet point. This is probably a good exam question. So tax efficiency. So remember that. Partnership agreement. This is just a legal and binding contract side side letters. So think about this. So uh, you're the uh, you guys all live in what I say Spain. So we have an agreement and that agreement is in contract. So then when I open it up to people from another country, let's say Iceland, then so the Icelandic people, they might say something like, oh, you know what? Uh, we don't really like that contract that you have with all of the Spanish investors. We want a different contract. And it's going to say something like, look, we know you have a contract with the Spanish investors, but we don't want you preferring them. We want you to prefer us. So that's what a side letter is. Yeah, look at the bottom uh, when an investor requires concessions. And so new investors that come in, they really don't want to get cheated by the old investors. And it's really just a matter of uh, old versus new. And then we can do these uh, separately managed accounts, just like we do for regular old stock and bond investing. And what this allows us to do is uh, is have a large investor who says something like, you know what, take my money and I want you to invest uh, in the long position in a gold futures contract. And so that might be appropriate as part of an asset allocation for all of our other hedge fund investors. But this one here, this large investor who has lots of influence. And after all, we want to we want to uh, invest in what that uh, 
risk and return objective is for that particular, I'll call him, him or her a client, but think of it as a separately managed account. What are the advantages? There we go. Tailor-made portfolios, transparency, right? Capital allocation. That makes sense. But it's more operationally complex. That makes, uh, that makes perfect sense. Now, how can we indirectly invest in uh, hedge funds, a fund of hedge funds approach? So instead of investing all this time in evaluating all the hedge fund managers, we'll just hire a third party and say, you know what, you do all this kind of stuff. So what are we looking for? Look down at the bottom, lower investment minimums, right? If you have a portfolio of hedge funds, shorter lockup periods, favorable exit, which means uh, improvements in liquidity. So that last bullet point down there, those, the, that, that's a really good exam question. But you may, you might pay higher fees. Um, you might not have access to all of the funds that are out there. They might be closed. Um, you might have greater liquidity. That's probably a good exam question. But look at the bottom. Managers must possess expertise in evaluating hedge funds. This is what I was saying just a moment ago. There are ETFs out there that try to replicate hedge fund investment styles. So look at that second bullet point there. Generate returns with high correlation. So that's the problem there uh, with these uh, hedge fund ETFs is that you may think you have a high correlation, but you might not because you're going to have differences in liquidity, differences, differences, differences. And so uh, these are good things. These are obviously uh, beneficial to some investors, but they're not for everybody. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we sacrificing liquidity? Why are we uh, paying a performance fee? Why are we doing the 2%? And the answer goes back to what we talked about from the very beginning of, uh, of level one. What do we want to do? We remember that first learning module we talked about holding period return. We want to buy low and we want to sell high. And so what are those sources? The sources are alpha, the sources are beta, and the sources are whatever else you can throw in uh, to those two Greek, uh, to those two Greek uh, letters. So what can we do here? We can do... Uh, market beta. So what are, what are we doing here? We're all simply saying something like, you know what? We really like this particular sector, so we're going to overload all of our long positions in this particular sector. Maybe we really dislike this particular sector, right? So this we're going to we're going to short those uh, particular stocks. So what are we doing? Take the market beta. This is what I was saying earlier. I hinted at this. You know, you have a beta of one, so you take the long position. That's a beta of one. If you take the short position, that's a beta of of a minus one. And so what you're trying to do here is you're trying to ride the wave, ride the wave of the uh, of the ocean as it uh, comes into uh, as it comes into the beach by the way uh, feel free to explain the three things that I don't understand in life I don't understand traffic I don't understand tides and uh, uh, lots of other things that I don't understand so when the waves come in I don't understand how tides go in and out that's really stupid there so forget you forget the last 20 seconds of your life uh, how about a strategy beta where we have a all right, so the first market beta, that's just, you know, the flow of the market trying to take advantage of ups and downs. The strategy beta is exactly what the Institute wants us to learn when we do this bottom up approach where we find uh, uh, individual security and that we want to ride that security, that one either upwards or downwards, long or short position. And then, of course, alpha, we can go all the way back to the mid 1970s for uh, Michael Jensen's alpha. What's that? This is the difference between. Remember this alpha is only the, diff the always the difference between the actual hedge fund return and the expected hedge fund return. So there there's the alpha. So we want positive alphas. We want high alphas. And so we can use all of the stuff that we learned previously and apply them to uh, to alphas. Now, look down at the bottom. Um, you know, you have you have a beta and an alpha. Does that mean that we can just throw the capital asset pricing model or the arbitrage pricing theory? Does that mean we can throw those things out? Uh, 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 the Institute says no. I'll just uh, I'll just stop right there and lead us right into the capital asset pricing model. You know, do yourself a favor. The next time you have two seconds uh, of downtime, you know, type in hedge funds and capital asset pricing model and see what you get. And I promise you, you'll get something like this. You'll say, hey, here's the capital asset pricing model. It says something like, you know what, investors hold well diversified portfolios. 
So now what we need to do is say something like, all right, so William Sharp, 1964, he was, his entire focus was on equity securities. And so he yeah, developed this capital asset pricing model. But then the question is, can you extend that capital asset pricing model to other asset classes? Is there a collectibles asset pricing model? Is there a hedge fund asset pricing model? And of course there is. There are lots of professors out there who are writing papers on this. So what has to happen is that in order for you to apply CAPM, to the hedge fund universe, you have to say something like, what is the beta? How are we gonna compute the beta of a hedge fund compared to the S&P 500 index, compared to the Morgan Stanley bond index, compared to the collectible index, compared, what is, what is that? That's the problem with extending these traditional asset pricing models to the alternative investment universe. Does it mean that it can work? Uh, it, uh, of course it can. Have we figured that out? Not, not quite. So look down at the bottom. This is what we're trying to do. As a hedge fund manager, we're trying to exploit some of these pricing efficiencies that may arise from Harry Markowitz and the efficient frontier and the capital asset pricing model. Now remember what these efficient markets hypothesis founding fathers of finance tell us is that uh, if there are these inefficiencies, then they only exist for a short time period. So in the hedge fund universe, I really don't know what that short time period is. It's clearly longer than a day. You know, if you were to say to me it's five year period, I'd probably say that's way too long. So, you know, what's the point here about how you can use the capital asset pricing model to help evaluate hedge funds? And the answer is you can. I'm not quite sure that we're there yet to be able to do such a thing, but here's, here's a great answer to the question on the exam. It's probably a good starting point. It's a good starting point to evaluate and find over and undervalued securities. All right, here's just a quick slide on uh, some fee structure. So typically a hedge fund is gonna say, you know what? Um, if I have, uh, if I have uh, 10 billion of assets under management, you're going to pay me 2% of that. And then if uh, the value of that was, what did I say, 100, if it's 130 at the end of the year, then you're going to pay me 20% of that 30, right, of performance fees. Um, but what these hedge funds have is they have what's called a, a high watermark. So if the hedge fund loses value, then there's no performance fee until you get back over that, uh, that high watermark. All right, here's, the, here's this uh, couple of slides on how investing in hedge funds um, compares and complements uh, stuff that we did back in uh, in our original conversations about equity securities and fixed income securities. And so what are we trying to do here? Still, let me give you that, uh, let me give you that sense. We're trying to push the efficient frontier upwards and to the left. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to earn absolute returns under all market environments. So what does this mean? Whether stock prices, whether bond prices, whether credit default swap prices, whether whether all of these things go up or down, we want to earn a positive return. So think about uh, think about that great great movie by uh, that Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy played in Trading Places. They had a conversation with Duke and Duke, Mortimer and Randolph Duke. And Mortimer and Randolph were explaining this to Eddie Murphy. They said, hey, when our investors lose money, when the market goes down, we make money. And when uh, investors make money, when the market goes up, we make money. So that was the Duke and Duke securities there. Of course, Eddie Murphy had one of the great lines. He said, he looked at him and said, sounds to me like you guys are a couple of bookies. If you've never seen Trading Places, make sure you go watch it. By the way, it's not a G-rated movie. There are people in there that are in their birthday suits. So if that offends you, don't, don't watch it. Yeah, how do we do benchmarking? This is what I was saying pretty early in this slide deck is that uh, it's super difficult to come up with some kind of a, uh, some kind of a relevant benchmark, benchmark for lots and lots of funds. You know, look down somewhere in the middle there. So we're made fund to funds, a composite index. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take an index over here and an index over here, and we're gonna throw these indexes and we're gonna call them a composite so that that gives us a better sense. Uh, it's clearly, it's clearly not as efficient as an equity benchmarking.
Now, what we can do is we can evaluate the performance based on the strategy. We can say something like, you know what, let's take a look at the strategy. Let's compare it to other hedge funds, similar strategies, and see what uh, see what we come up with in terms of an annual, annual basis. Of course, we're going to do this with some kind of risk-adjusted uh, methodology using publicly accessible information. All right, let's finish this up here quickly. Um, the Institute is very big on behavioral issues. Let me just remind you that there are two types. There are mistakes up here. We call those cognitive errors, errors of the brain. There are mistakes right here. We call those emotional biases. And so how do we, uh, how do we uh, uh, scan the behavioral finance universe to try to pluck some behavioral issues that are relevant to the hedge fund universe. So we have a selection bias. So think about <clears throat> we're trying to if we're trying to put in together a benchmark and we have a selection bias. In other words, if we have a fund that goes out of business, is that in there or not? We can self-select. That's a survivorship bias down there on the bottom. We can select and we can delete. We can identify some of those firms that we may or may not fit feel that fits into the strategy. And then we can uh, go ahead and fill in some missing data. So there we go. We have a selection bias. We have a backfill bias. We have a survivor bias. And so finally, we need to worry about this concept of... Uh, the weighting scheme. So most hedge fund indexes do not weight uh, by assets under management. And so it's probably going to be an equal weighting. And that, of course, throws us uh, throws us off just a little bit. So my, the whole point of this, and I think this is what the Institute is trying to and trying to emphasize, is that benchmarking is super difficult. You know, that's why in the very beginning we look at absolute performance. But then, you know, of course, we're going to try to come up with some benchmark to evaluate the performance of a hedge fund manager. And so it's super difficult. And so it probably comes down to uh, it probably comes down to just a, a sense of are you comfortable with this hedge fund manager? All right, how about let's end on diversification. What did I've said to you multiple, multiple times, diversification, correlation, coefficient, uh, those are super important. So that takes us through these learning outcomes. Um, I want you to go look at the, I think it's six or seven problems at the end of this learning module. I'm gonna go ahead and make a bold statement. These are super easy. I bet you can do them in two minutes. Two minutes, 30 seconds each? Yeah, I bet you can. So go through those, this will really, really lift up your confidence. Uh, work on those problems quickly, and I'll see you next time. So thanks for watching, and good luck studying.